Well, first of all, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us. Very much appreciate it. Thank you. Pleasure being here. So first of all, let me start off with uh, the uh, US government's uh, commitment to climate change. A lot of governments, a lot of uh, political, a lot of politicians talk about climate change, but a lot of people would, would a lot of people from other countries might doubt the uh, US's actually commitment to do something about climate change. So, so where does the administration stand on climate change? Oh, there's no question about where the president stands on climate change. You just have to listen to his inaugural speeches, both of them. Uh, his State of the Union speeches. Uh, he is uh, not backing off. He says uh, this is one of the key things we have to address. Uh, in addition to that, the many states in the United States are taking very aggressive stands. They have, uh, they're, they're very proactive in uh, clean or renewable energy portfolio standards, energy efficiency, those things. But it, not every state does this. This is typical of an American democracy. You find that cities and states are the foreground, they're the leaders. Uh, once you get something done federally, you have to bring a lot of people along, uh, and so it's happening. So I think if you look at what is happening over the last number of years, certainly right now this particular Congress is, uh, in this session, this two years, uh, we, don't, we don't expect a comprehensive uh, climate and energy bill. Nevertheless, the President has made it very clear that uh, there's a lot of administrative things one can do. Don't you think, though, that uh, with all the new oil discovery and uh, the, the f uh, gas and fracking and the, the, the new uh, accessibility of uh, fossil fuels, so as to speak, that the pressure's been taken off uh, climate change? America's got all the oil it needs, so why bother? Well, that's when people are confusing um, the uh, repercussions of continuing unabated and continuing to increase carbon dioxide from uh, the ability to get energy to run an economy and to grow economies. And so they are, uh, you know, just because, uh, because of the new fracking techniques both for oil and natural gas does not mean that the carbon emission problem has gone away. Uh, it's still there. Now having said that, um, uh, natural gas, uh, if uh, extracted safely, environmentally responsibly, you know, with controls over potential fusion of emissions is a good transition. While we develop the technologies to capture and sequester and maybe even utilize carbon, uh, we're going to have to do that no matter what by mid-century. Not only for coal, but for natural gas, for pointed minerals like cement and steel and other things. Uh, but the good news is this technology, especially the cleaner technologies like wind and solar and things that I talked about, uh, their price is coming down. I project, uh, this is me talking, not <laughs> an administration, um, certainly within 10 years, wind will be at parity with new natural gas uh, without any additional subsidies, completely level paying field, some say earlier. I think solar doesn't have to get there because of the local generation capabilities, but maybe 15 years it's going to get into this very exciting regime. All good things. Energy storage also developing very rapidly because when you go to 20, 30, 50 percent renewables, you will need storage, you will need better transmission and distribution. Right. Uh, uh, and, but then having said that, we're not talking about more expensive energy. We're talking about energy that reaches parity or becomes the low cost option. Okay. But cynics would say, uh, cynics would say, forgive me for this, but cynics would say, you're not off to a very good start. I mean, look at all the, the government money that's uh, gone into subsidies for solar power companies that, uh, mm -hmm. that frankly have failed. Well, that's exactly why I was uh, talking about what I was talking about using the auto industry. There, I could have used the airplane industry. Uh, many bankrupt airplane uh, mm -hmm. industries, a lot of government money. They were the first buyers of airplane services, the U.S. mail, among other things. Uh, so you can say, yes, because many companies have failed, therefore it's a doomed technology. And the automobile industry was a perfect example. You know, in, in the teens, uh, 20 years after, you know, 15 years after the first Fords, um, 127 companies. By the 60s, we got down to three. Right. Okay. Uh, it was a consolidation. Sure. And then even uh, a company like General Motors or Ford, they were separate automobile companies, you know, a Cadillac, a Pontiac, a Buick, a Chevy. 
But in actual fact now, there may be three or four chassis, three or four engine sizes, and it has become a consolidated company. Ford is doing the same, Toyota, right. you know, Mercedes, so on and so forth. Well, I mean, turning in slightly, the, obviously you're an APS member, and uh, what do you think, what, we'll turn to the science a little bit here and the physicist. What do you think the role is of physics uh, in, in all this? Uh, no different than it was 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 200 years ago. A lot of the fundamental discoveries in science and physics, uh, you can't be sure when they will leak out into invention, leak out into innovation, which is, means deployment and private sector investment. Uh, sometimes it happens very rapidly. Uh, sometimes it happens much more slowly. Uh, rapid one, uh, optical communications of fibers very, very fast. Um, within less than a decade after optical fiber amplifiers were invented, they were deployed, maybe seven or eight years. That's pretty fast. Uh, you look at all the semiconductor technologies that were developed. Bell Labs had a concerted effort to invent a transistor. It was a physics problem. It took 10 years. And then after another 10 or 20 years, uh, all the, most of the semiconductor physics was developed after you had the first transistor, a deep understanding, mostly done by physicists, of, of how electrons move in semiconductor materials profoundly changed the world. Do you think, I mean, the, the, when we look at the other thing that's going on in uh, Washington at the moment that captures everybody's attention with the sequester, do you, do you think that uh, the message is, is agreed by everybody how important science is to the, to the US moving forward? I don't think everybody thinks that um, uh, investing in research, including basic research, uh, in times of austerity, are, you, you have to keep it up and have to sustain it. Uh, but uh, one of the things I try to remind people is in the deepest, darkest times of American history, I would rate the Civil War as, if not the darkest time, certainly one of the darkest times, uh, where the whole nation was pulled apart. You, you didn't know whether a union was going to be preserved. It was by far the deadliest war we've ever had. During that time, a few months around Gettysburg, um, Lincoln did an amazing thing. He started the land-grant university system. They give federal lands and start a college, a university, and to do two things. Uh, it's to train people in the agricultural and mechanical arts, okay? Because the agriculture was gonna be a basis, but also the mechanical arts. So, you know, many of the state universities that we all know about, their land-grant schools, uh, what people don't realize, that MIT, Cornell University, wow. University of California, Berkeley were land-grant universities. Uh, they were part of the mechanical arts part. This was done in the deepest, darkest moments in the Civil War. When would that pay back? Not for 20 or 30 years. It would take 10 years to establish a university, another four years for them to create the first crop of students, or five years to establish another five years, and it won't be for another 10 or 15 years before those students become in a position to help really shape society. They took a long view. Another amazing thing, transcontinental railroads. They said, could we make investments, federal subsidies, to link the railroads together and linked the United States and, and settling in California in the western part of the United States. He signed that uh, in 1862. Big subsidies to railroad companies. Within 10 years, the first transcontinental railroad was completed. Final thing, and this is something that took a long view. Lincoln said, it's really important for the U.S. government to get the highest quality scientific advice because many of the decisions we will be facing in the future are dependent on scientific advice. So I'm going to establish a new advisory group called the National Academy of Sciences. The only, it would be separate from the government. There wouldn't be government workers. The only objection I have to that is it was written into the law that the people giving advice couldn't be paid money. <laughs> <laughs> Secretary Chu, thank you ever so much indeed for joining us today. We really appreciate you taking the time. Such a busy day. Thank you very much. You're welcome.